Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can come together on this day, your Sabbath day. And I pray that as we open your word this morning that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide our minds and our hearts into all truth. I pray that your presence will be felt among us, Lord. And I ask especially that my words will be your words and not my own, is my prayer. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. We're going to have a little historical journey today because I want to talk to you about one of my favourite people from history and that is Martin Luther. You all know Martin Luther, no doubt. Martin Luther was a German gentleman born in a place called Eisleben, which is about 180 kilometres southwest of Berlin in Germany. And he was born in the year 1843. Now, Martin Luther's parents were very poor. His father was actually a miner. He used to go and dig in mines each day to be able to feed his family. But Martin Luther was also very clever. He was best blessed with wonderful intelligence. And he actually went to the University of Erfurt at the age, the grand old age, of 13 to study law and he actually graduated with a master's degree in the shortest time that it was possible for the university to be able to produce a law student. So a very talented and a very clever man. In 1505, Luther was nearly struck by lightning on the road to Erfurt and I can say that I've had the privilege of being able to visit these places and I've seen the signs. And this was a very... Um, uh, interesting moment for Luther because his life completely changed that day and he decided that he was going to become a monk because he was nearly hit by the lightning in this lightning storm and because of that obviously it meant he also was going to become a Catholic priest. Now Martin Luther must have been a very tenacious man because everything that he did he did with his fullest intent. He did to the absolute best of his ability and Luther was extraordinarily successful as a monk, but we know that being a monk in the traditional sense of the word meant that he had to hide himself away from society. He put himself up into a place that was hard to reach and he spent his life in self-abignation, which is what they call it, and prayer. He plunged himself into prayer, into fasting and self-denying practices going without sleep, enduring bone-chilling cold without a blanket and flagellating himself with a whip. One of my favourite stories is about what they call a hair shirt. Have you heard of a hair shirt? A hair shirt is a shirt that is made out of leather with the fur still attached to the other side and when you put, it's more like a jacket, and when you put it on, you put it on with the hair part facing towards your skin, so it produces nothing but constant irritation. So you put this hair shirt on to irritate your body, then you put your warm clothing on top of that in order to keep yourself warm. It was a form of self-punishment. Why was he doing this? What would make a person want to do these types of things to themselves? Fasting going without sleep, bone-chilling cold, flagellation, hair shirts. It's because Martin Luther believed that doing these things was gain, going to gain himself a place in heaven. What do we call that in the modern day language? We call it salvation by, by works. That's right. Because this is what he believed was the right thing to do in order to gain salvation, in order to gain heaven. He said himself, if anyone could have earned heaven by the life of a monk, it was I. He recognised there was something worth having and he was trying to earn it in his own way, his own works. Martin Luther was seeking God with an honest heart the only way he knew how. The key to that sentence is honest heart. He believed he was doing the right thing. His heart was open. 
But unfortunately, after all this time he spent as a monk, and I believe it was many years, he was not having any success. He didn't feel as though he was getting any closer to God, and he did not feel as though he was, certainly didn't feel as though he was gaining heaven. In fact, he said this, he was increasingly terrified of the wrath of God, and when it came, when it is touched by this passing inundation of the eternal, the eternal, the soul feels and drinks nothing but eternal punishment. Martin Luther felt that even with everything he was doing, he was pouring his whole heart into it. He was trying to work his way to try and find a sense of God, to try and get himself to heaven. But the only thing that he was sensing in his life was eternal punishment. It wasn't working for him. Martin Luther was being torn apart inside, searching for God but being totally unsuccessful and fearful of the doctrine of the church that he was a member of at the time, which believed in a place called eternal damnation. It believed in a place called hell, where you went to and you burned forever. Thank heavens we as Adventists do not subscribe to that doctrine. One day, Martin Luther was at a place that we now call the Scala Sancta. The Scala Sancta is a set of stairs that can be found at the Basilica of St. John in Laterino. Has anyone been there? I'm fortunate enough to have been there. And it is believed that these stairs were transported from Jerusalem to Rome and these were the very stairs that Jesus climbed as he went to be um, interviewed by Pilate. They're marble stairs. This is the story. I don't know if it's true or not. Most likely it is not. But they did come from Jerusalem. And the stairs have been worn out over time. So what they did was they've gotten timber and they've covered the stairs. So people can walk up and down. Well, they don't actually walk up and down the stairs because what Martin Luther was doing was he was on his knees and he would get on the first stair on his knees and he would say his rosary prayer and then he would climb up the next stair on his knees and he would say his rosary prayer and then he would go up on the next stair on his knees and he would say this rosary prayer and there's something in the order of 50 stairs. And if you go to that church in Laterino today, you can see that there are people there who are actually still climbing the stairs on their knees. I've got photos of it. You can see them if you want to see it. Martin Luther, on this particular day, got halfway up the stairs and he was struck by a thunderbolt. No pun intended. And he remembered Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Have you ever had that experience when you're actually walking, uh, you, you're pondering something on the Bible or about God and all of a sudden you get struck with a thought and you recognize this is, the, this is, what, this is what it means. I understand this now. Have you ever had that experience? I have, but not often enough. Well, this is what must be what happened to Martin Luther because he recognized that wearing the hair shirt and praying and bone-chilling cold and flagellating himself and fasting and all these self-denying practices is against what the scripture tells us because in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17 it says, the just shall live by faith. Turned his whole life around and it began a journey of transformation for Martin Luther, from a priest who was trying to seek God and heaven through works, to a priest who believed in the God of heaven through faith. The results of Luther's transformation reverberated around Europe and reverberated around the world via the Protestant Reformation which we are still feeling the effects of today. As I said before, Martin Luther was very tenacious and when he came upon this truth that the just shall live by faith, he compared what the scripture was saying in relation to that verse as to what the church was actually doing and behaving like at the time and he saw this great discrepancy between the two. The church was his life. 
He was a Catholic priest. In fact, Martin Luther was a Catholic priest his whole life. He never left the church. But he had issues with the doctrines of the church in relation to what he was reading in his Bible. Interesting, isn't it? And it was this that started what we today know as the Protestant Reformation. We're still feeling the effects of it today. Luther's belief system was torn apart in his mind by the Bible truth and he had to re-educate himself in order to find the God of peace that he was so desperately searching for. What was Martin Luther looking for? He was looking for peace. He was looking for rest. He was looking for that place that he could be where he recognized that he was in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he was looking for. And he recognized it in that verse that says, the just shall live by faith. There is another example in the Bible of the same internal torment happening to another leader in the church at the time. And his name was Nicodemus. I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at the story of Nicodemus and we're going to be comparing that to the story of Martin Luther to see that there's a lot of similarities between the two. John chapter 3 and I'm going to be reading from verses 1 through to 6 and I'm reading from the New King James Version so if you have a Bible that's a different version you might be reading it a little bit differently but the meaning of the words should be the same. John chapter 3, verses 1 through to 6. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is is spirit. Friends, there's a whole world packed into these verses. In verse 1 we see that Nicodemus was a man of the Pharisees who was tru truly seeking God. Now here's the first connection with Luther. We need to look at this guy Nicodemus and recognize that he was the spiritual ruler of the Jews at the time of Christ. He had been raised in the synagogue. He knew the scriptures. He understood what the Pharisees were doing. And so he was one of them, so to speak, if you want to put it that way. A spiritual ruler of Israel at the time. A Pharisee established in the ways of works. We recognize that in the Jewish way these days, there is ways of works. Yet, Nicodemus was seeking God with an open heart even through his whole lifetime of education his whole lifetime of being indoctrinated in the way of the Jewish people he saw something in Jesus he saw something and that's what led to this interview that he had with Christ in fact he risked a lot by meeting with Jesus because he knew that if his peers in the Jewish religion found out, he'd be in a lot of strife. But something was compelling him. Something was driving him. He needed to know truth. And we'll flesh that out a bit in a, little, in a moment. It also says in verse 2 that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. I mean, what does that tell us? When people are doing things at night time, what does it usually mean? It usually means that you're doing something nefarious. It usually means that you're doing something that you don't want other people to know about. It usually means that you're doing something that you don't want to get caught. 
I mean, I've read this in books. I don't, I don't have any personal experience, of course. But he came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus' faith was not yet established in Jesus. He didn't know who he was, but he was very curious. He was being driven, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. He was afraid of being vilified by his peers if it became known that he was seeking Jesus. Because we need to remember the fact that the Pharisees at the time were trying to destroy Jesus. But here was a man who was seeking him out because he saw something special. Nicodemus was not yet willing to stand up for that which he was beginning to believe. Nighttime was the time to do deeds that could be much more easily concealed. It says in verse 2 also that Nicodemus told Jesus that we know that you are a teacher come from God. We? That's a plural word, isn't it? Perhaps Nicodemus was sent to represent a delegation of Pharisees in the Sanhedrin that were wondering if this man was from God. Perhaps there was more like Nicodemus, but he was the only one brave enough to actually go and have an interview with Jesus. There were some wonderings going on inside the Sanhedrin. Could it possibly be that this man was from God? We know that you are a teacher come from God. A teacher from God. He wasn't yet recognizing that he was the son of God. But he was recognizing there was something special here. And he wanted to know more. And that's why he was making an effort to introduce himself, to get himself acquainted with Jesus. Because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That was his reasoning. He came to Jesus, he said, we are wondering who you are, whether you are a teacher from God, because nobody can do the signs that you're doing. Now, let's just take a moment at that point. We are in John chapter 3. What signs had Jesus actually done to this point, according to the book? Now, I went back through John chapter 1 and John chapter 2, and I only saw two things there. Number one was the miracle that he performed, which is recognized as his first miracle, as turning the water to wine at the marriage. And the second sign that uh, Nicodemus could be talking about, and I'm having a feeling that this might be the one that he's referring to, was the story revealed in John chapter 2 of Jesus getting very, very cranky with the money changers at the temple and turning over all their tables and saying, how dare you turn out my place, my father's place, which is a place of prayer, into a place of business and commerce. And not only that, where they were running this, uh, these businesses because they were selling doves, they were selling lambs, and people were making money. And you know, usually when you go to a tourist place and you buy something, it's ten times the price. So if these people were coming to the temple and they were trying to ask to get their sins forgiven and they needed to bring a lamb to sacrifice and they didn't have one, the lamb that they were buying at the temple that they could have got somewhere else maybe for ten dollars, they were asking two hundred dollars for it extortion, commercialism, profiting off the fears of the people because of their belief in what they must do to gain acceptance with God. I believe that Nicodemus was looking at what was going on in the temple. He was looking at what was going on with the Pharisees. He was comparing what he was seeing happening with what he was reading in the scripture. Martin Luther did the same thing. He compares what he sees going on with what's written in his Bible. And a conflict begins to occur. A problem comes up. Why isn't this? What's wrong here? And when Nicodemus saw Jesus go to that temple and he saw him turn those tables out and yell at those people and chase them out of the temple so he could turn God's house of worship back into what it was supposed to be, Nicodemus' heart must have been gladdened because he recognized finally there's someone here that's willing to stand up for the truth. It could have been that event that caused Nicodemus to go and see Jesus because he was standing up for what he believed in as he read it in the scripture. 
The spirit of prophecy tells us that Nicodemus' heart was yearning for truth and the peace of knowing God. And here he saw a man that was willing to stand up for what he believed in. The spirit of prophecy also tells us that Nicodemus recognized the current spiritual leadership of Israel had lost its way and was rife with immorality and corruption as the money changes affair exposed in the scriptures. Was this not also Luther's experience? You know what Luther's main issue was? It was with a guy called Tetzel. And you know what Tetzel was doing? Have you heard of Tetzel? Tetzel was going from town to town in ancient Germany and countries surrounding, selling what they called indulgences from the Pope. Because he was trying to raise money, and this is all historical fact, he's trying to raise money so they could build St. Peter's Basilica, which we see the beautiful building in Rome today. And these indulgences would say to someone, okay, you purchase an indulgence from me and your sins are forgiven, not only today, but also for the next two months, three months, six months, 12 months, depending on how much money you give. Was that in harmony with what the scripture tells us? Absolutely not. And that's what Luther was standing against, that type of immorality. And Nicodemus was also wanting to stand up against that type of immorality that he was seeing going on in his church. And when he saw Jesus, he recognized here is someone that's willing to stand up. I must find out more about this man. I must know more about him. Jesus told Nicodemus the same truth that Martin Luther experienced 1,500 years later. And it is the same truth that we must recognize today. This is not just something that's limited to Nicodemus. This is not just something that's limited to Luther. It is a truth that we must see today. Because what did Jesus say? He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Let's have a look at verse 3. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's an interesting thing to say. And that was verse 5. Let me read verse 3 now. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus didn't understand this. Now, this is an interesting thing that Jesus could, should say this because Nicodemus had just got through saying that, you know, I've come to see you because I'm not sure who you are, but I know that, you know, you must be from God because of all these signs that you're doing, all these things that I see you doing. And Jesus kind of shifted the whole thing a little bit because he gave an answer that I wouldn't expect that he would give. When he said to him in verse 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus was looking into Nicodemus' heart. And he recognized that here was a man whose eyesight was on earthly things. Earthly things. And, but Christ knew that in his heart, he was searching for the truth. He was searching for what Jesus knew would have to be a spiritual insight. And so we said to him, sort of changing the subject a little bit, but what Jesus was trying to do was to raise Nicodemus' eyesight so we could look from earthly things and start to understand spiritual things. And that's why he says, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is where, in verse 4, we see this answer coming through from Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus's eyesight obviously is still firmly set on the physical things because he replies and says, how can a man be born when he is old? Because he's thinking of being human birth. He's thinking of earthly birth. How can a man be born of old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, it's a reasonable question to ask, isn't it? But all it's showing us is that Nicodemus really doesn't understand what Jesus is getting at. He really doesn't understand you know, I'm always amazed at Jesus' patience and tolerance with those who are seeking for the truth. And thank God that he is. Those who are seeking the truth with an open heart can take anywhere between three months and 25 years to find it. 
But God is patient and he continues to work with those people to guide them along the path that he knows that they should go so long as he knows that they are looking with an honest and open heart for the truth. Isn't isn't it a wonderful God that we serve? He took 20 years to get me here. I praise the Lord that he's patient. And I saw that smile, Marilyn. Marilyn. Jesus was confirming Nicodemus' belief that there is a kingdom to be gained. Jesus was telling Nicodemus that to gain that kingdom, he needed to be spiritually reborn. He needed to have a change of heart and a change of mind. He needed to be spiritually reborn. And this rebirth that Jesus was talking about was not the rebirth about going into the mother's womb. I think it's illustrated well, this rebirth concept is illustrated well by Luther when he was nearly struck by lightning on that road. It completely turned his life around. He changed a different direction. That's what a spiritual rebirth is like. It's like having your water, uh, your... um, your heart and your mind changed into a different direction. And we read again in verse 5, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, Jesus is giving Nicodemus a clue, a hint. He's saying, this is how you find the kingdom of God. I'm going to give you the secret of eternal life. Unless one is born through the water and through the spirit, One cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was referring to rebirth as a water and a spirit experience. As we look through the book of John, we find that this water and spirit experience is a theme that recurs more often and more often. And this washing and regenerating experience is found in multiple places in scripture. You know, when I was over in Jerusalem recently, I saw the big bowls, the big stone bowls and the taps that they have right outside the western wall and as the orthodox Jews to come in and they're going to go down to the wall and say their prayers and put their prayers in the cracks of the rocks they all go up to this big cistern and they turn a tap on and they wash their hands and their elbows like this ritual washing it's a cleansing thing very very important to them before they go down to the to the wall but what does the bible say about water washing I want to share just a couple of verses with you If we go back to Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3, there are some wonderful verses in here that explain what Jesus was talking about to Nicodemus when he was saying you must be cleansed by the water and the spirit. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3. You can underline these verses, they're beautiful verses. This is what Isaiah is expressing to Israel from the mouth of God himself. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty. What does it mean to be thirsty? It means to be yearning for something. And in the physical sense it means I thirst, I need water to quench my thirst. And in the spiritual sense it means I am spiritually hungry, I want to know God. And God makes a promise here. This verse is a promise. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit onto your descendants and my blessing upon your offspring. I love this verse because it expresses that God is just dying, no pun intended, to pour his spirit out. Unto his children, just like water. Turn with me to another verse. Just a couple of books over in Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 25 to 27. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. The same situation. This is in the context of the renewal of the children of Israel. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is God talking to his children. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you 
and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. What a wonderful example of the idea of the washing with the water and the spirit. God is yearning to put a new heart and a new spirit within us. He doesn't stop there. He says, I'm going to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What a wonderful promise that is. Does God leave us alone on this earth? He doesn't. He certainly does not. And this is the message that Jesus was trying to get across to Nicodemus because Nicodemus was, was born into the study of the Old Testament. He knew these verses. And when Jesus said, you must be washed with the water and the spirit, I can just imagine these verses flooding into Nicodemus's mind and his heart being opened up towards God because he was hearing the promise again in the New Testament from the one, the very one who gave the same promise in the Old Testament. Again, we look in John. Turn back to John. This time we go to chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. One of my favorite stories, the woman at the well. And we see again this theme of this water and spirit symbolism being revealed again. John chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11 and then 13 to 14. Jesus is at the well and he's having a dialogue with this woman. And he says in verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, mark that word gift, gift. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Can we see the connection back to Ezekiel and Isaiah? Living water. And verse 11, and the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you plan to get this living water? So the woman at the well had her eyes on earthly things, the same as Nicodemus. She didn't have the spiritual ability to be able to understand what Jesus was talking about. So he goes on and he explains it further. In verse 13, he says, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. There's the physical level. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Friends, what a beautiful promise that is. Jesus is saying, you can drink this physical water out of this well, but you're going to get thirsty again. But when you drink the water of the spirit of life that I can give you, when you have a relationship with me, then you're never going to thirst again. Not only are you never going to thirst again for spiritual things, you're going to become a fountain of water overflowing. Because that's what a fountain does, isn't it? It's got water coming out all the time, seemingly endless. And what does that fountain of spiritual water do for the individual? It quenches the thirst of those around him. Can we see the wonderfulness, the beauty of this verse? Jesus was trying to raise Nicodemus' sights from the earthly to the heavenly. To show him that he was the son of God. To show him that to find eternal life, he comes to him. Nicodemus would have known about the verses in the Old Testament, but not the New Testament because it wasn't written yet. But he knew what was going on in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament and the New Testament are like two bookends. They're connected to each other and cannot be divided. The New Testament, I've heard it said, is the Old Testament revealed. And the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. They are in total harmony with one another and God is repeating the same thing over and over again. So we can't say that we didn't know or hear it or understand it. Did Martin Luther experience a change in his life after meeting Jesus through his word? When Martin Luther was hit by the thunderbolt on the Scala Sancta, did it change his life? Luther was completely appalled at the, at the day, the papal church of the day, and was teaching and living in direct contradiction to the scriptures the church was, both morally and physically. He said at a public debate in Leipzig in 1519 that, quote, 
A simple layman armed with the scriptures was superior to both Pope and the councils without them. I can't imagine the church of the day would have taken that too well. It was heresy of the highest order and he was threatened with excommunication. But this is the level that he had come to because he decided that he was going to follow the Bible no matter what. In 1521, at the Diet of Worms, standing before the Holy Roman Emperor and the highest authorities of the church, Luther was asked to recant his position. And he stated this unequivocally. And his position was that he believed that the Bible was the primary source of all doctrine and understanding about God. This is what he said. Unless I can be instructed and convinced with evidence from the Holy Scriptures or with open, clear and distinct grounds of reasoning, then I cannot and will not recant because it is neither safe nor wise to act against conscience. Then he added, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. Amen. Those famous words. And we see 500 years down the road that the Protestant Reformation is still going strong. Not because of what Martin, uh, Martin, because God used a single man that decided to stand firm for his faith. That's why the Protestant Reformation was successful. Let's ask the same question about Nicodemus. Did Nicodemus experience a change in his life after meeting Jesus in person? We have evidence later in the book of John that Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus had a profound impact on him. We recognize this was the man that was sneaking away in the night so he could talk to Jesus without anyone seeing him. But Jesus, uh, Nicodemus appears again in the book of John. Let's turn over to chapter 7. Chapter 7, verses 45 to 53. I want to read these verses to you. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees and said to them, Why have you not bought him? The Pharisees had sent the officers of the temple to go and get Jesus and bring him back. Why have you not bought him? And the officers answered and said, No man ever spoke like this man. These were men of war. And they couldn't lay a hand on Jesus because of the words he was saying. I wish I could have been there to hear what was said. Verse 47. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know him, uh, this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And in verse th uh, 50, we see Nicodemus' name mentioned. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Well, Jesus didn't come from Galilee, we know that. But here we see evidence of the effect that this interview with Jesus has had on Nicodemus because further down the track, he's actually with his peers and now he is standing up and he's defending Jesus. And he's saying to these other Pharisees, Do we condemn someone before we know what they've actually done? So he's growing bolder. He's recognizing the truth of what he has seen. Perhaps he went home and studied his Bible and he looked at those water verses, the water in the spirit that we looked at before and recognized what Jesus was telling him. And he's saying to himself, here is a man that I can follow. Here is a man that I can Devote my life to. And the last verse, John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42, which shows us again what Nicodemus has been doing. John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42, and Nicodemus pops up in the story again. This is in the context of Jesus just having been crucified on the cross. Verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus in verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds. You know how much that's worth? It's a couple of thousand dollars in today's, today's money. 
And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen and with spices and the custom of the Jews was to bury. Nicodemus was not afraid anymore. He was not afraid to go to that cross. He was not afraid to spend a, a large portion of his life savings to buy the spices that needed to embalm the body of Christ. He was growing bolder again. Here we can see the growth in his heart. He too was having an impact on the culture of his day. Martin Luther and Nicodemus are both wonderful examples. 1,500 years apart. How many other people within that time have had the same experience with Christ? When they've met him and they've accepted him and he's turned their life around. Because what does God have to offer us? Rest, peace, joy, hope for the future. An understanding of a future kingdom that we can be with him for the rest of eternity. This is the living water that can spring up in our lives when we accept these truths. And we can feed other people with these. God wants to use each one of you that you might be empowered by the Holy Spirit to tell other people about him. Because each one of you has access to people that I can't get to. That no one else can get to. God is calling you to use you that you might tell others about his kingdom. The same as he called Nicodemus, the same as he called Luther. Perhaps not with the same dramatic results, but one person in the kingdom for God that you can bring every time there is a soul that accepts Jesus Christ. The spirit of prophecy tells us that the, heaven, the angels in heaven rejoice. Friends, I would call, I would challenge each one of you to look into the things of the gospel and the truth of God and see what impact God can have in your life. This is my prayer for you in Jesus' name.